Welcome to The Gap, where it's our mission to bridge the gap between javelin and baseball training styles. I'm Bret Hart, coach at Grind Athlete Performance and founder of Hitman Performance. I'm Dan Labadia, javelin coach at Southern Connecticut State University and the man behind Jacked Javelin. Hope you guys enjoy the show. You want to be exceptional, but you're afraid to be the exception. Don't be confident. <laughs> <laughs> I can't finish that one. <laughs> I can't finish that one. Man. Oh, man. All right. Yeah. yeah, episode two of our throwing series. Last episode, we talked a lot about like the technique and the technical components of the throw, whether it be javelin or baseball. I feel like well, that was one of our be- better episodes. Right. Definitely. So and if it, if it doesn't do well, I'm reposting it next year. <laughs> <laughs> we will repost this until it does well. Yeah, so if you haven't listened to I did the same it, thing with my Tommy John episode. I was like, man, this was a good episode. We put it out too early. We didn't have a big enough reach. It's going out again. <laughs> Still flopped. <laughs> no, it did really, it it did really, really well. well the second yeah, time. see? There you go. Sometimes you got to reduce see, your cycle. Not, yeah, man. The con- old content was good. It's just quality no one knew wasn't about there. It. The reach wasn't there yet, but yeah. 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 Um, so if you didn't listen to last episode, probably highly suggest listening to that. Today will just all be about the strength training component of it. So if you're weak as piss and you don't have the strength to back up the technique that you have, the technique work kind of doesn't really matter. And right, so you still need to have a lot of force output and a lot of strength and a lot of muscle around the area that usually gets hurt, whether that be like your hamstrings or your elbow or your shoulder. Like if you don't have any type of strength in any of those ranges of motion, you might be a little out of luck with trying to actually go a little bit further in your career. Yeah, you know, that's the big thing that we notice is that there's a lot of, a lot of people have different technique styles. Um, a lot of people break down when they throw max effort, but at the end of the day, people that throw far have a common theme is that they're physical freaks, you know. They are able to produce a lot of power and um, are very mobile, well-rounded athletes. And so that's kind of what we're going to be getting into the next two episodes specifically, or no, three episodes specifically is more of the physical preparation aspect of it. And so, um, you know, me talking obviously from the javelin side, Brett talking from the baseball side, I actually think what's really ironic about me and Jack Javelin and kind of last year when I started this quest to like make javelin more mainstream and reach out to other javelin coaches and baseball coaches and stuff like that is a big thing that I was trying to do was like kind of influence the baseball world to show them like how, how aggressive we throw the one K and the two K and like we are anti-fragile and we bench press and like, um, we take a more aggressive approach to lifting and arm care. And, you know, we train almost like, like you would imagine like a football player would train essentially. And you, you don't look at us and say, like, oh, these guys train like baseball players, you know? And so, that was a big thing that I was trying to do was influence the baseball world. But what's actually really funny is that the baseball world influenced me a lot, um, a lot more than I had anticipated, you know, and I think that that is a testament to show like when you are trying to do something or reach out to other people, always go with like an open mind of like someone like, you know, you could learn something from a lot of different people, you know, Every conversation you go into, try to have an open mind and and think like, all right, this person has some type of life experience, some type of athletic coaching experience that I haven't had, and I'm just going to listen to them and see if anything is useful. And so that's what I did a lot with uh, Dr. Heenan and and Luke Dawson down at uh, ATP, and then also Summer's Method down in uh, St. Pete, you know, connected with Juice Factory, I'm wearing his hat right now. And I've, I've connected with, uh, you know, I went down there, filmed with them, watched a lot of their content, have been in contact with them since last year as well. So the biggest thing that I've learned from them is really the unilateral stance. And I've talked about this before, but like, that's so important for like the, the block leg and the trail like mechanics is getting comfortable and explosive in that that split squat position or that that reverse lunge position and um the pitch do- the pitching doctor does a lot of plyometrics in that split squat as well kind of working on the stretch shortening cycle and stuff like that which i think is huge because you know my whole career up until last year 
I always programmed and trained in the bilateral stance where, you know, deadlift, power clean, hang clean, snatch, um, squat was all bilateral. All my jumps were pretty much bilateral too. And so I got really used to that position. And it's like when you throw, like we talked about in the last episode, you know, your block leg is in front of you, your trail leg is behind you. And you are, you know, you're essentially in that, that split position and, um, you have to be comfortable in that position. You have to be mobile there. You have to be explosive there. You have to learn how to keep your, your center of mass, uh, directly in between your left and your right leg so that you know, you're able to use your trunk effectively. And all of those things stem from being stable and strong in that position. And so that's something that I started incorporating a lot because of those three guys. Yeah, I know Heenan has been on unilateral training. Like he loves the reverse lunge. The reverse lunge is really big. And like the 90 mile an hour formula and like everything that they do, any type of like posterior loading, like with a safety bar, or I haven't really seen him do barbell reverse lunges, but I'm sure they do the same thing. And I remember starting off, I always looked at the reverse lunge as an accessory movement. Mm-hmm. I like doing a lot higher reps, more so for like a hypertrophy effect, not so much a strength and power aspect. So making that switch definitely is beneficial for a lot of our like uh, baseball and javelin athletes and really any sport in general because you're going to find yourself in that split lunge position pretty much any sport, probably not golf, but that's a lot of like challenging different imbalances that you might have from years of just doing bilateral squatting, years of having hip shifts that you might not be too aware of. Like everyone has, if you ever ask like what's like a weak leg like what's your bad leg? Like everyone has a bad leg. Mm-hmm. Everyone has a bad arm. Like there's imbalances that like need to be worked on to be a little bit more well-rounded as an athlete. Coming from like a powerlifting background, that was a hard transition for me to make just because I loved squatting and deadlifting. Like those are like my two, like squat is probably my favorite lift like out of all of them. Like I still think, like I don't think this will ever change because it hasn't. Like an athlete should be able to perform like a high quality squat, like just because like, yeah, we do want to have a strong unilateral position, but I still think you should be able to have the fundamental movement pattern of like how to squat. I think it's just good to know. And it's also pretty easy to track force production. Like I'm not saying you need to squat 500 pounds, but like just to be able to like hit depth and like have the proper mobility to be in a deep squat with load, whether that be with a safety bar, goblet, um, SSB, or the SSB is a safety bar, like back squat, front squat, goblet, zercher, like finding the right squat variation that you need to have and able to do it. And another reason why I think it's important to learn is because there's a lot of college programs that don't think this far ahead, like has like Heenan or like those guys that they're still going to program back squat regardless of what like our opinions is, like our opinions are. Mm -hmm. So we can say a split squat or reverse lunge is better. Yeah. And you have a lot of evidence to support that it's right. Like it's more sports specific, but those college coaches, when we lose them for like six months out of the year, we lose them for half the year and they're going to squat. Like I would like them to know how to properly squat. So they're actually able to perform it at their highest level. And especially like some of the high school kids that I have that, like I had this one kid on Thursday night, he was like, I squatted 265 in my football lifts. All right, let's see what 135 looks like. He's cut in depth. His chest is falling way too far forward i have him on a slant board and he's still like doesn't have doesn't bend his knees at all like he's all hinge on the squat and i was like dude don't ever squat 265 again please i was like it definitely yeah. didn't look good at it's all awful. so like being able to know like the population athlete you are it's good to have these opinions and good to have these discussions but you also just need to know the reality of like what it is like old like the old school style of coaches will back squat you they will barbell bench you you need to know how to do these things and you need to be like pretty well versed in them if you want to be able to like be successful in your sport because the strength coaches talk to your sport coaches if you're just wimping out on every lift that you have there like it's not optimal like sorry like you still need to learn how to do it yeah i think so too and i think that it's obviously having just an amount of exercises in your library is always beneficial for you you know you just more athletic keeps you fresh learning new things and i kind of like 
still even now like all right yeah we're gonna train really heavy in the bilateral stance and then you know we'll take like a month or two or like maybe if we do like a heavy back squat mondays we'll do like a reverse lunge on thursdays and that'll be like a a little bit lighter i think that like yeah you haven't you're gonna build power in it even when you're not going for max effort i think that like part of it is is the stability aspect Mm. and so getting more reps in there isn't always a isn't a bad thing you know obviously like especially too when you are used to doing the bilateral movement doing more reps in a unilateral movement will help you kind of acquire the skill a little bit faster because it just builds that mind muscle connection that muscle memory of like you know if you're doing it if you're doing four sets of one each side versus four sets of 10 each side like you're doing four like you know 40 times like the volume or whatever so it's like you're just getting a lot more reps under your belt so um it's one of those things where i think that the yeah the you could still recruit a lot of power even if you did a split squat jump you know with the dumbbells without the dumbbells and stuff like that and then you know doing a lot of reps with the reverse lunge i think is helpful but it's it's one of those things too where um you got to see like what your main goal is and like i remember for me personally like i I pretty much did all unilateral squat, you know, back squats from like February until July. And then I switched back. Um, I probably took like a three week break from legs in total, like in June. (laughs) And then when I went back to back squat, my back, I had started hitting like PR numbers within like eight weeks, just because like, I think that there was parts of my hip flexors and, um, just like my glutes that I had firing in the unilateral position that I didn't really get as much isolation in the bilateral stance. So when I went back to the bilateral squat, like back squat, I was, you know, hitting like I did four Oh five for five sets of two, which Mm -hmm. I was never able to do before. Yeah. I think the thing about like, like the classic staple three or like even the Olympic lifts, which we'll get into Like there's such an emotional attachment to a lot of these exercises of like the squat, the bench, the deadlift, hang clean, power clean, snatch. Like there's a lot of emotional attachment to these exercises. Like you can get very athletic without doing any of them. Like you Mm -hmm. don't need to do like all those exercises. There's other variations and different training styles that you can implement, whether it be like the Parisi speed school that they do like a lot of fascial training. They do a lot of like plyometric sprint work. They do a lot of aqua bag, like tidal wave. I saw that you just got, they have the, um, like the metal cylinders. I keep forgetting the name of tidal those things. Tank. Tidal, same thing. Tidal wave. Tidal wave. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. But it's like the tidal metal wave. cylinders, like they're training, like, like, like the fascial system a little bit differently than how you would do with like the traditional, like squat bench deadlift. So like, I think, Like a good story is like the Max Scherzer story that I think I've talked about before where he's working with Eric Cressy. Eric Cressy, uh, again, like a forward thinker in the field, wants to like have him do split squats, reverse lunges, wants to use single arm landmine press, uh, like oscillating, like seesaw, dumbbell bench, like stuff that like opens up his scaps that'll help him. And Scherzer's like, dude, I'm back squatting and barbell benching. Like, this is what I did that got me here. Like, I'm not going to stop doing it. So he had such an emotional attachment to his squat and his bench that Cressy was like, all right, fine. It's like, just do it. Like, because like, it's just like such a mental thing with a lot of these guys. Like if, if I got a program that didn't have any type of like squat or deadlift in it, like I probably just wouldn't do it. Yeah. Cause I, I just, I truly just enjoy those movements and I get a lot out of it. So I think there's, there's that piece too. So it's just like how you were brought up and I got your style of training. Like everyone has their opinions on things. And like, like the West side guys are going to have their opinion versus like the PRI guys versus like the Mike Boyles who like doesn't do back squats at all. Like he just does all unilateral strength training. And like you can make a case in point for no matter what it is, it's mainly going to be the consistency of what you do. Yeah. So like as long as you stick with it long enough, like you will see the results that you're looking for. Yeah. I was going to say, that's why I'm actually like really grateful for a lot of the struggles that I went through as an athlete is just because I wasn't someone like Scherzer, like for me, like where did the back squat and the bench 
get me nowhere, right? Yeah. And so I was always somebody that like always looked for more answers because of that. And so it was like same thing with javelin technique. It's like, all right, my current technical model, where did it get me? Hurt, undersatisfied with my result, right? So it was like always looking for more. I never got like, I was never that guy that was like, oh, I did, you know, bench and squat and stayed healthy and I threw 70 meters, became an All-American and like, I, you know, it was good. It was like, no, like I, I did all that stuff and it went terrible, <laughs> you know, it was like, <laughs> yeah. then I had to figure out like, all right, kind of reverse engineer backwards, like reworking the technique, reworking the mobility, thinking outside the box with like the weight room stuff and um, really learning the rhyme and the reason behind everything and like how to program and implement it and like how to do it with an athlete that's not great, how to do it with an elite athlete, how to implement it to myself who doesn't train full time like anymore. Like obviously I, compared to the normal person, I train, you know, I still train like 10 hours a week, which is a lot, but it's not the 20 hours a week that Jordan's doing and Evan are doing, you know? Mm. So it's like, you know, for me, I feel strapped on time with 10 hours a week. I can't fit everything in that I would want to fit in. But like, um, you know, there's just now it's like, because I've done the research and I've had those struggles and the ups and downs and like had the experiences of like training post collegiately and stuff like that. It's like, I know how to program for three different types of athletes. Now it's like, I know how to program for a post collegiate for someone like like Nevin who went from being not very talented to now being one of the best throwers in division two, someone like Jordan who went from being always really good to now being best thrower in the nation. And so, yeah, so it's like those experiences have allowed me to get to where I'm at, but like that's where if you're somebody that kind of like defies the, um, you like someone like Scherzer who has had a lot of success. It's almost like, yeah, he's going to be a really good athlete, but he might not be, I, I'm sure Scherzer will be a great coach if he wants to go into coaching. But like a lot, a lot of times you see people like that not be the best coaches because they just had such a straight and narrow path. And when they start coaching someone, and then they got to start putting fires out. And they're like, I don't know, like this is what I did, and I just had this like linear path, and it worked for me. Yeah, you know. So it's like that's why having those struggles and the deep dives like helps a lot. Yeah, I mean, I, I made the post the other day, like, I got my squat up pretty well, but did I, like, increase my exit velocity, or did I throw harder, or did I run faster, like, not really, like, it helps to a point, and I think that's where, like, just the emotional attachment comes in, like, I still have college guys, like, for football, they're like, because that's what they see, you gotta think of, like, what social media, like, highlights, and, like, what ESPN or Sports Center posts for lifting, like, will they ever post, like, a perfect goblet split squat? Or like a reverse lunge, Cossack squat, or a co- or like a lateral lunge or a lateral squat, or like a like a lateral sled drag, or like stuff that like is training different planes of motion, like that is very beneficial to the sport. Like no, they're not going to post that. They're going to post Nick Chubb squatting four hundred five on a tsunami bar. It's still a squat. And the bar's bending like crazy. Like that looks cool. They're going to post uh, the kid from Colorado that squatted six seventy five, no belt, no sleeves, did it pretty easily. So when they see, or, or like a Rollis Chapman benching 350, it's like they they see the exercises that get a lot of the hype, and a lot of the time is just like the old school like squat bench deadlift, like those are the things that look cool, like Saquon Barkley, uh, power cleaning 405 is freshman year at Penn State, I think it was. Yeah. So like they see things that like highly successful athletes do, and they're like, I need to do that, and like as coaches, we can see that that's clearly like not their issue. Like they're elite level athletes, not because they're really strong. They're just like really good at their sport. And like, they have different qualities that like you don't have, like you getting your squat from 405 to 455 probably won't help you in like your 60 yard dash or your 40 yard dash. Like if you're playing football or baseball, like you probably need to work more on the unilateral training, like being able to actually use your hip flexors and like driving them up and feeling the sensation of like what your glute is feeling on the opposite side, being able to switch properly, being able to get a top end velocity, like being able to have your legs cycle and like actually knowing like how to explode off the line in a 10 yard acceleration. Like there's so many intricacies that you can get of like what actually matters that people just don't see that. 
and they just see the cool stuff on Instagram. Like he didn't post that all the time, like half rep, 500 pound back squat, like 10,000 likes, like 300 comments, like perfectly well executed, like 225 reverse lunge, like two likes, no comments, like no shares. Yeah. Like it's just the reality of it. And so that's where I think like the people that really want to get better will like seek out like that information oh yeah and so they'll they'll find a way to like tailor their programs towards that but i think a lot of strength coaches just get into like a little rut of like this is just the way it needs to be done when that's not really the reality yeah and it's even like with the the title tank and stuff like that it's like uh, tidal wave tidal wave but when you have stuff like that where yeah you see jordan using it jordan's using that because he's not throwing right now taking a break from throwing, working on just like stability, acceleration, deceleration, working more on the approach and the lower half in his throw. So it's something we add in like in place of it. That's not like the, it's not like the recipe for success. Yeah. You know, like I see like even I kind of, I don't really like a lot of this. I mean, I don't know. I haven't tried it yet. So I shouldn't knock it, but I see like they people put it on as like a backpack and they're doing like the three cone with it. <laughs> yeah, I'm just yeah. like, is that really necessary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, you're just doing it while you're like doing agility work. I, I think that I think it's good for like in place of a med ball because you have it does slosh around and you have to stop it, you know. Yeah. It's it's tough when you're doing it like whipping it like full speed like that or like holding it up. You know, it's good to use like when you're going through the the penultimate, you could kind of see like if you're leaning back, all the water will be down this way, and then it'll kind of take you this way. Take no pun intended, but like you got to keep it above your head to make sure that your shoulders are level, like to make sure that when you're doing your penultimate, you're staying linear instead of leaning back. So like there's benefits to it, but it's like he still threw 84 last year without doing that ever. Yeah, you know, like we literally just implemented it now, so it's like. Um, you could still get very far with, you know, the bilateral stuff. It's just like, like you said, if you're somebody that you want to get that extra edge and like, um, really take it to the next level, the unilateral stuff really could help you, um, kind of harness that, that stability in that, that power generation in that, in that stance. Um, and I think that that's like my next, like, like I was talking about in the last episode with like the kid that can't, you know, it was like 220, but can't bench his own body weight. It's like, dude, you don't need the, you don't need the next program. You just need to redo the first one, like Mm -hmm. three more times, you know? Yeah. I think we talk about like the lower half a lot and like the posterior, like everyone should know by now. It's funny to think that like a lot of like, it's funny. Like you think people know a lot more than they do until you start like asking questions and they like, don't know like stuff that like seems like common sense like you need to work your posterior chain more because those are your go muscles like your glutes your hamstrings your calves like everything in the posterior to help you propel yourself forward and then you like talk to some people like they don't really understand that like kids especially like oh yeah that makes sense like you didn't know that before like not really it's like a lot of those guys are just playing to play but like the posterior chain i think is probably the most beneficial for whatever sport you play like like your back back of the shoulders glutes hamstrings like those muscles are what's gonna one probably like reduce a lot of the injuries and help with like your explosiveness being able to get your hips fully extended that's what i want to talk about a lot of kids can't get hip extension so that's where the posterior chain comes into play like being able to actually drive their hips forward like a lot of like you see a lot in a broad jump, like mm. when they when they jump out, like their hips don't move forward at all, like they just jump and they land and like that's when they kind of land and they fall on their face, like they fall forward. That's when I know if they fall forward, they didn't get their hips through at all. I would rather an athlete jump out and fall back, because once they fall back, that's when you know like your hips are like fully locked out and you can't get any further. Mm. So like that hip extension is extremely important for like the sprint. So like being like the ten yard acceleration and the broad jump. Like those two exercises are very like correlated. Like our athletes that have like the better broad jumps tend to have better accelerations. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that's like a pretty direct correlation of like you have powerful hip extension. Mm -hmm. Like you're able to do that. 
Yeah, it makes sense. When I would start going past like 30 yards, I would start losing speed. Mm -hmm. But then like my triple broad jump was like 10 yards, which is like pretty, pretty good. So like makes sense that my because remember I held the facility record. Yeah, and so I was like my top my top end speed like wasn't that great. And I was like, I would be able to, I could I think it was like 110 was my broad jump like inches yeah, yeah yeah and then like my triple was like 10 yards so it's like i was like really good at that stuff but then like <laughs> the 5 10 5 is terrible <laughs> yeah you know yeah i mean that 5 10 5 is a big we'll talk more about that in the the speed and like plyo episode but like the 5 10 5 is a lot of technique based which i was showing you but even then that's like there's exercises that are very close to mimicking like those motions like it's a lot of lateral movement, it's a lot of lateral crossover steps, a crossover sled drag, like going sideways, pulling it, and like having the the leg closest to the sled drive the knee up and then push it back and actually feeling what it feels like to push the ground away in the opposite direction to go the way you want to go. Um, any type of Copenhagen plank or the dip, and like training the uh, adductors and like that lengthened position because that's a very common injury, and catchers always complain about their hips. Uh, pitchers will sometimes complain about it like their block leg they get into it too aggressively that adductor might just be too weak so it's not taking in all the energy transfer from the back leg so then it travels up more into like the internal rotators of the hip which probably like will definitely not be as strong as like those types of muscles that are going to be in the inside of your leg Mm -hmm. so that's where like they can get like that block leg pain or their right lower back like the right ql like i know you had that issue yeah as well and so like mine was my left side because of the block the left side block like falling into it yep like that spinal uh flexion to the side Mm -hmm. and then like yeah basically like my it was from i never trained that so as and my so as was really tight from like you know back squatting and whatever so like my left so as was super tight and it was also weak it didn't have like the proper like range of motion and strength and um i also never threw out of a full approach unless it was in a competition so then essentially like when i start started going out to the competitions like every week every other week i would start having that lower back pain on my left side from hitting the block because my body just wasn't Mm -hmm. it wasn't used to it and by as the season went on i actually started figuring out like all right if i stretch it and like if I strengthen it and kind of do the couch stretch a lot, then I would start doing like the uh, banded psoas pulls. Had I known about kettlebell lifts back then, I would have been doing a lot of those with like a deficit and like a strength through length movement. And then a lot of hip lifts where you like lay down on the ground, put your toe up straight inward, outward, and just lift the foot. Mm-hmm. And you just feel that cramp right there in the psoas. Did all that stuff. And then by the last meet of the year, finally like held up yeah so um but yeah that's like all that strength through length stuff that's like super helpful yeah i mean you're one of the first people that like i've talked about like because all the mobility that i was ever taught like ever done was like extremely passive and like it was like the pigeon the couch stretch like the frog like yoga type movements like those are all great exercise and they have a time and a place for it but i think it's like anything where you get to a certain point where you need to start strengthening like those newfound ranges of motion. And like, I remember I pulled my hamstring, my junior, senior year high school, like I was prone to hamstring pulls for a variety of reasons that I'll talk about in the sprint episode, but made long story short, I just wasn't sprinting consistently enough. But I remember getting like, I was limping off in the field cause I pulled it bad. And my coach was like, did you stretch? And Sansone actually had my back and he's like, coach he's the only one that stretches like no one stretches so i was mobile like i was able to like palms to the ground mm. like i can grab my feet like i can bring my forehead to my shins not now not right now but like during baseball like i took like a lot of pride in like my mobility and like it wasn't really like it was that mobility and flexibility but i wasn't strong in those positions so great i just got a bunch of new range of motion now but now once I access that range of motion and I try to add power to it or speed to it, they're weak. Yeah. So that's when the pull, that's when the pulls happen or the tears happen. That's like, 
when like all doing all like the mo mobilization stuff's great, but if you don't strengthen any of those newfound uh, ranges of motion and like the deep intricate muscles that are in there, like that's where you're gonna be more open to injury of like, like oh I'm, I'm in this position but I've never trained it before, so there it goes. Yeah, and like going off like the mobility stuff too, kind of tying it back into the um, <clears throat> the unilateral bilateral was like that was what I learned as well was like. I was able to deadlift 550 pounds, conventional, no straps, right? And then I was able to power clean 330 pounds, bilateral, no straps, just hook grip, right? And so I was super strong in that bilateral position, producing force from the ground. So obviously my back had to be in loaded flexion to be able to get to both of those positions, whether it's clean or the, or the deadlift. And that, those are like pretty decent numbers. And then if you see me in the bilateral stance doing the sissy squat to back bend, I could do a full back bridge. I could be sitting back in that um, thunderbolt pose on the ground and then go, you know, bring my hips forward. Like we talked about good hip extension, tilt my head back, touch my head to the ground, spinal, spinal flexion, right? Spinal segmentation. And why did my back hurt when I was, um, you know, throwing? It was because, like, I didn't train the psoas, like, in that unilateral stance, in the stance that was, like, specific to my sport. I didn't train it in a way that would actually, like, benefit me. You know, it was mm -hmm. like, I was super strong, super explosive, super flexible. My spine was really mobile, right? all in that bilateral stance, but then it didn't, you know, it didn't translate to my sport because I didn't train it. I didn't train like the psoas itself. I didn't train the QL itself and like how I would actually use it in the, in the sport. Cause like, right. If you're talking about like a GHD QL dumbbell loaded flexion to like extension, a it's yeah. a side bend. And so when you're doing that block, it's a side bend when your psoas is decelerating and your leg is decelerating, it's that psoas right there. And it's like that hip flexor. Yeah. You get that with the, with the psoas holds or the couch stretch. You're not really getting that with the, <clears throat> you're getting it to a certain extent with the, with the reverse Nordic curl or the back bend, but it's more of the spine. It's not this, right? Mm. So it's like, yeah, you could have good static mobility, but it could translate to your sport so poorly if you don't know the intentionality behind it. And like you said, like how to strengthen it and lengthen it and like actually get into the deep ranges of motion that your sport's actually going to use. Yeah. I mean, I think like the side bend is something that saved my back because like I've talked about like like my back injuries in the past, like I herniated two discs in my low back deadlifting. And like, again, like wasn't strong in that flexion position. When you're not strong, your body is going to try to compensate for something to try to get the weight up. So that's where like my spine was just in a compromised position doing trap bar deadlift, which is funny because everyone says trap bar saves your back. I actually blew two discs out on my back. So nice. um, it's all relative. Like every exercise has some type of inherent like risk to it. That's why you train. And that's why you like find different ways to prevent it. But I remember like of post, I don't even know who it was by or anything, but it was like side bends are bad. Like they're not like great for your core. And then I was like, maybe I wasn't, didn't really think too much of it. I just like stopped doing them. And then medicine started posting more side bends. Uh, ben Baguette posted a lot of them. Austin would post them a lot. And like, I remember started doing them and my QL, like, my QL is on my right side is like chronically tight. So when I do a lot of the side bends, nothing gets my QL more sore than like, like a heavy, like set of eight to 12 side bends, like being able to like, do you do that with a, like a carry or overhead? I do them underneath. I've experimented with overhead. I'm very limited in range of motion with the overhead. I like the barbell on the back. I watched this one, like the, like, like holding like a barbell back squat and going side bends. I do like that one. I prefer the kettlebell because the kettlebell kind of like weighs you down more. Like the weight's more distributed lower. So when I go down, it feels like it's just pulling me more into the position. Whereas like a dumbbell is like the weight's more on just like on either side of the handle. 
so it doesn't have like more of like a pull down towards the ground i don't know it could be it could just be a feel thing but like i remember watching this guy that would like squat every day and he was doing something he said he got it from chinese weightlifting like when they warm up like they go full side bends with the bar they go Mm -hmm. rotations with the bar and this is prime time learning about mike boyle in college like springfield or like any type of spinal movement is bad mm-hmm. like if you move your spine like you're gonna get hurt like full fear mongering like that's when he's like it, the core is all like anti-movement like the core is made for not moving at all and like holding static positions like the pal off hold um like the overhead pal off hold uh side pal-off planks, hold planks. With, uh, play on your thumbs yes yes that's a good one right here all the weights on your hand but yeah so like that was like prime time of like i'm learning from him and he's like all against it so i started doing that like what he was saying and it felt worse so i was like this is kind of bullshit and then i would start doing all the stuff that you guys were talking about and it just made way more sense of like i'm gonna find myself in these positions like when i pull when i put a bench away in the weight room like this is this is going into like I'm not an athlete anymore, so this is what I have to refer to as when I'm putting a bench in the back in the weight room. The handle is like next to the ground, so I'm in spinal flexion, lifting the bench up and dragging it into the rack. Like it's not a neutral spine. Like I'm not bracing my core while I lift it. Like I'm in full spinal flexion, being able to do it. Like three, four years ago, like when I hurt my back, I would have been like terrified of that movement, of like being able to like bend down like that and go like put it back. So like when I think about like that, I think about like the adult clients of like what they do on a day to day basis. They have kids; they're constantly picking stuff up off the ground. Yeah. Like when their kids just throw stuff, like babies and toddlers and stuff, they just throw things. So they just constantly flexion, flexion, flexion. So like training extension and flexion, being strong in those ranges of motion, so those back pains don't happen. Like actually being fluid and like having some type of movement in there is also important for the athletes too because. Like you can hold a pal off hold with a red band for 30 seconds and then you're playing football and then someone 350 pound DN smokes you like your core is not going to withstand that. Like there's <laughs> going to, there's going to be, there's got to be a different way to train that. That's more applicable to like those types of situations. Like even in basketball too, going up for a layup and they hit you on the side, having the strength to be in the air to still have some type of finishing ability and not just get thrown five feet back. And like having and the ball just flails away. So like having those types of like mindset shifts of being like, I'm watching the sport, I'm seeing what's happening. None of these guys are playing with a completely neutral spine and their core is not braced the entire time. So why am I training that motion like for just my core? Like that's where I think Boyle has it wrong. I think there's a time and place for resisting motion. I think you still should be strong and like doing those types of movements. But if you watch like how they move and how they run, it's very fluid, it's very aggressive, and very powerful. So you should be finding ways to train like your trunk and your core that way as well. This is him. Yeah, it's my boy. He's been coaching longer than I've been alive. He's yeah, been I was coaching gonna for, say like, 35 he's a little years. older. You know what he used to look like when he was younger? Was mm-hmm. he? He was a power lifter. He was actually a power lifter, and he completely sh- shifted gears, and he's the full unilateral. Uh, he's like the fms guy right no um he does a lot of fms stuff though so i just want to know what this dude looked like in his prime because like based i'd have to have a conversation with him but based on how he looks now i just wouldn't trust him you wouldn't be able to have a conversation with him why he is so set in his ways he's an he's a old dog that you can't really teach new tricks he he'll teach That's like a lot of javelin coaches he'll though, teach new tricks when he agrees with them so like it's very like black and white with him like i've heard him speak multiple times it's very black and white with him and i'm not discrediting him as a coach and or as a business owner like he is very successful in his own right like he's done a phenomenal job with like his system but i do disagree with like some of his ideologies and his reasonings for like why he says what he says so like i think that's where like we come into play of like up and coming coaches of like challenging these guys like austin's been challenging Boyle for like a year now and like won't he won't have a conversation with him because he's like just shoes him off what about ben patrick ben patrick knees over toes again has like a lot of the stuff that he says is very similar to what you guys says he just packages it a different way and like once you make an exercise this is where like like it gets a little fishy 
is like once you glorify a certain system and like make it seem like it's the only right way to do things that's where people like lash out and where it's like no there's like way more options out there so that's where it's like it's hard for me to like say like what's great and what's bad like there's obviously certain exercises that are like terrible for like the given individual but i can't discredit ben patrick's millions of people that he's helped get out of knee pain and back pain but there's also millions of people that did his program and their knees got worse their backs got worse like they feel worse so they go to jake tur and do the jumpers knee protocol and they, that helps them so like there's every person's going to be different every person's going to have an opinion on things that's why like an athlete needs to figure out like what's best for them and what works for them and that's where the coach comes into play is like help guide them in that scenario yeah absolutely i think that like um i've tried to be like obviously the i promote it and talk about it a lot but like you know with the lifting and jack the javelin is obviously about building muscle and getting lean and, and kind of being just a freak athlete overall but I've, I've tried to kind of adapt the way i've talked about it i think the last year like i think i used to have an extremely like hard stance on like on some things um but like at least now like I'll, if i do have a hard stance on something it'll be more in like the the instagram short term content mm -hmm. and like if you actually like sit down with me or listen to the podcast or listen to the youtube like i'm extremely open-minded about a lot of things um i just think that like it's just it's really hard to not contradict yourself especially when you start pumping out content like every day since the time you're 24 your opinions are going to change about things and i even talked yeah. about how like one of my first viral videos i don't even coach that way anymore and a lot of my actually a lot of my best videos have been stuff that i've talked about and it's kind of been like i probably wouldn't word it that way anymore yeah. you know um and i think that like I think it's okay to like change your mind about stuff and, and, um, and kind of grow and evolve as a person. Um, but I just think that like, obviously being super strong and being mobile and being a freak athlete never hurt anyone. You know? No. Yeah. That's definitely like, like I say, all this to say is like still get as strong as you possibly can to get as fast as you possibly can like play your sport, be the best you can, whatever sport it is. Just know, like, try not to overthink it. Like, leave that for the coaches to do that. Like, that's where, like, we spin our gears. And, like, that's what why we're coaches and not athletes anymore. Of Like, we're going to be, like, the type one that you were talking about last episode. Of, like, we're going to be the ones that are going to be super analytical. And we're going to be the ones that have the discussions about, like, what's better, trap bar jump or an Olympic lift. Athletes don't care. Like, a lot, like, 90% of them, just want to know if this will help me get better at my sport. Yeah. So like, that's what we have also have to realize. It's like we can only have these types of conversations this is why I like the podcast and why I like Instagram and like social media is like, you can actually have conversations with other coaches because in my day to day, you could try, you could try. Yes. You, all right. Jesus, there it is. Dude. You can try, oh my God. but it's like, like, uh, like my day to day clients, my, like I can't yeah. talk about this stuff to anybody. Yeah. I think that like, like I was telling you too, um, for me, I love having conversations with coaches about it, but what I hate is when a coach like doesn't introduce themselves when just starts like giving off advice, commenting stuff or like DMing you, like telling you how it is and stuff. And, um, I don't know, just like, look at, look at my track record and then introduce yourself and say hello to me first please yeah you know what i mean it's yeah. just like some coaches are just so dumb in that sense where they, they just they don't they like forget that like we're humans you know what i mean not that like i'm I'm like sensitive or whatever but it's just like dude like say hi treat me like a person first and then like we can talk it's like that whole thing that you talk about like they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care yeah it's like you're like I've already, I've accomplished a lot as a coach and I'm really young. So obviously like I'm doing something right. Okay. So if you're going to critique something I'm doing, like I have to respect you first. Don't message me saying like, 
totally disagree. Here's why. Yeah. I would I will literally send you a video of Jordan Davis throwing eighty four meters <laughs> and me handing him the national championship yeah. trophy. Just, or or just the straight <laughs> spaghetti emoji. Yeah. Yeah, no yeah. more unsolicited advice. Yeah. Yeah. It's gotta go. That gotta that go. stuff with coaches is like, dude, if you're a young coach out there, you know, um, please just remember if you're reaching out about something. Be a, be a person and, and be respectful. Be a, you know, introduce yourself. Say hello. Dude, I would Don't, like those I would like those coaches to go to, like, a commercial gym and go yeah. up to a random person. This is essentially what they're doing. Like, they're going up to a random person they don't know, and they're telling them everything they're doing is wrong like, yeah. in their face. Like, go do that in real life. Go to a commercial gym. You will find somebody doing an exercise incorrectly yeah. with 100% certainty. Like, someone will be doing something wrong. Yeah. So like if you're willing to do it on social media, try it in person and see the type of response you get. Yeah. Like like if you go up to somebody like this is a completely terrible exercise, like you shouldn't do this. They're gonna tell you to f off. Like <laughs> like most of the time. Yeah. Like dude, like they a, think what they it think is. it like you're gonna be more professional and like nicer on social media. But like, dude, I, I don't will, know I'm you. I'm the opposite, bro. Yeah, I'm like, worse I don't, on social media <laughs> than in person. Like, bro, I don't know you at all. Like, why would I talk to you? Like, why are you in my messages? Like, this yeah. is like I'm not having this conversation with you. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I think that big thing with the posterior too, is like, I know you're talking about it from like a a power development standpoint with the upper body. It's really essential to do like a lot of those backwards throws to do, like we talked about with the title bag tank. (laughs) Wait, I keep messing the name up. (laughs) Title bag, (laughs) title tank is like working on accelerating it. The water's like rushing to the front. You got to decelerate it. Right. So Working on that deceleration aspect with the upper body is like, you know, your tricep and your rotator cuff, uh, your terrace major is like really important because obviously we know that the chest is what's going to accelerate the throwing arm forward. So everything behind it is what's decelerating it. And so you'll see a lot of like those, uh, you know, if you get any like tricep issues like I had uh, after my Tommy John surgery or like shoulder impingements and stuff, it really helps to work on like the posterior because you're doing a lot of those forward movements and you're accelerating, accelerating, accelerating. If you're benching, you know, you're doing pressing movements. If you're doing military press, you're going overhead. So that shoulder is like that ball and socket joint where if you're going all forward all the time, it's not good for your posture. So you need to do a lot of posterior backwards throws, cross body backwards throws, kind of even out that shoulder joint but then also prepare your tricep and your your rotator cuff to decelerate so after you release the javelin or the baseball your your body's able to slow down because what happens is you you could tell in sprinting too like that's why when you do get like above like you know your mid-20s and you're are you are in like your in your mid twenties to like mid thirties, you're in your strongest time of your life where, you know, early twenties, you're still developing your strength and your power. But with that, your mid twenties to mid thirties as a male, you're, you're the strongest, but you're also going to be, you know, you're, you're going to be bigger most of the time. And you're, you're going to start having to like warm up a little bit more and, and focus more on mobility when you get to starting to get older and more powerful. So that's why like, guys that you know they play in softball leagues or whatever like you know if they just sprint without preparing for it a lot of times they'll pull their hamstrings and stuff like that that's because their body's not prepared to accelerate and decelerate properly so like you just like we train the acceleration with with med balls and with throwing and with sprinting you also need to train the deceleration part as well where like your body's going to know if you aren't prepared to slow down after you throw a javelin as fast and as hard as you can, then it's not going to allow it to accelerate as mm-hmm. fast and as hard as you can. So it's like, you know, if your body feels like it's not prepared to do that task, it's going to put limitations on it. Where even if you are trying as hard as you go, as hard as you can go, you're not actually putting everything you got into it. Yeah. You're always going to have the, uh, the safety net or like the, the safety blockers. Because, like, subconsciously, like, you know, like, you don't have that. Like, either whether it's, like, range of motion or the strength. Like, a lot of the people, like, the kids will, like, will say that they have arm pain, like, right in, like, the 
like the back of the shoulder, like right in the armpit area, like right where like that, was that Terry's major? Yeah. Minor. But like uh, when they, I'll do like an arm test, like pretty easily, I'll have their arm fully locked out and I'll say press into my hand, no pain. Like this is fine, like they're really strong. I'll put my hand on the other side and all right, press back now. And they're like, dude, I can't. It's like my arm's like, doesn't move at all. And like this, that spikes the pain immediately of like them pushing back. So like, that's telling me like, oh, they're like, their decelerators are just really weak. Like the muscles in the back have nothing to give. So that's why like when you throw, like being able to put the brakes on too is gonna be huge. Like that's why like a lot of people like, I think overemphasize now, like it's getting a little better. Like that's why they said like don't do chest, like just do like spam the external rotations, like get that as strong as possible. Like Alec Blennis, Bennis, the, ultra, the marathon runner guy, like the hybrid athlete, he had a good post on it. It's like, dude, you've been doing the same band resistance for external rotations for like five years. Like, why don't you just treat that muscle like you would treat a barbell bench press? Like, if you were doing the bench for five years and you're doing the exact same weight for five years in a row, something's wrong. Yeah, like you didn't get any strong. You're not. Pro- there's no progressive overload. You can apply that progressive overload principle to literally anything. So, like training the external rotators. Like, yeah, maybe start with the lightest band and go up a band then change the shoulder angle and then add some type of like cable resistance where you go eccentric only or dumbbell like i know you like to do those ones a lot like being able to like load it so like eventually be able to get to like the 40 50 pound dumbbell that you guys use which is nuts to me i don't think my shoulder will ever be able to handle that but like training it well past the demands of it in the sport so like you just know in the back of your mind like my body's prepared for this like I will be able to like send it fully with no fear of like anything. Like I think subconsciously knowing like this light band that's like super easy, like is not gonna be preparing me. It just get me right enough so I can throw without pain, but it's not taking me to that next level. Yeah. I know too that you were saying I think that it was Cressy was the one that said, like if you're doing a dumbbell knee up rotator, you don't wanna go past zero degrees because this is like 90 zero you go past because then you got to be afraid of the forward shoulder impingement yeah but the thing is that i changed my opinion on that when i was talking to dr heenan about it because you know i did a lot of the here and then stop and go up and you're just basically working the you're working the external or you're working just like limited range of motion and then we would do the dumbbell er with like off the bench press where my you know my shoulder supported but my hand but my hand is back because I'm using weight. So he's like, you know, if you're going back with weight externally and then you're going down halfway and then back up um, with weight, is like just strengthening the entire range of motion is never a bad thing. Yeah. And especially too, because it's just like, I mean, if you're not scared of going ER with weight, like you shouldn't be afraid of going into it. Yeah. Weight. But so like, that's the whole thing too. It's like, like we talked about with the throws. It's like, if you're going to do a lot of throws forward, do a lot of throws backwards. It's like, if you're going to do the ER or the internal rotation dumbbells all the way down and up, I could get away with that without getting a forward shoulder impingement because I do so much external Mm -hmm. weighted stuff because I do so many rows and, you know, Y's and W's and stuff like that. So, that's all really important stuff is like when I'm, you know, I'm training ER weighted. So you can train IR weighted as well. Yeah. I think it's just like, I think it's getting a little better now. I just remember coming up like external rotation was like the biggest thing. Like I was talking to you about that in the last episode, like having like, like everyone's just chasing ER, ER, ER. So they're just like, like find different ways to get it. But like everyone knows, no one really trains like the internal rotation and being able to have their arm come this way. So they actually have like strength through that full range of motion, like you were saying, like it just, it's like a lot of things, but I think that was like taken over the baseball community a lot of like, that's why like J bands got really popular because it was like the full like rotator cuff series, like took over everything. Like they didn't have bands like that when like. I don't even know when they started, but like 
30, 40 years ago. Like, there was pretty high level. Like, Randy Johnson probably didn't have bands. Yeah. I know Trevor Bauer was the first person to have, like, the body blade thing. And, like, that thing is, like, all over the place now, and a ton of people use it. And, like, and then we have Tread coming out saying, like, hangs and crawls are, like, really good for arm care. And, like, it's probably one of the best options you can do. So, like, no implements whatsoever. Like, no fancy branding or anything. They're, like, find a bar and crawl on the ground. And, like, do those two things, and your arm will feel pretty good. And so it's kind of, like, flipped completely. Like, you need, like, a big bag of, like, all these different things just to get ready to throw. And then now tread, let's say, like, yeah, hanging for, like, a minute or two and then doing some bear crawls. Like, your shoulder will feel pretty good. And, like, there's no equipment needed at that. And there's no branding on that as well. Yeah. So I think that's where, like, then you get to the consumerism and the capitalistic mindset a little bit. I think people like to bounce on, like, anything that's, like, Oh, the body blade will make my arm feel great. Like, what do they do? They make three different resistances. They put their logo on it and they sell it for X amount of dollars. So everyone buys it. Yeah. So they, there's a lot of baseball like gimmicky products like that. I remember like having a ton of different things like bat with like a weight in the middle of it, like just like a stick thing. Like you, baseball is like notorious for that. Like the drills. Yeah. That's why like the guy Austin Dude, Schultz is like blowing up and like yeah. like having like all like the different all, routines. Yeah. yeah. That's like. Kevin and I were talking about that because, you know, Kevin was, like, the first person to be, like, basically, like, a full-time online, like, javelin coach. Um, and now I'm, like, kind of the second and stuff. And so we were just talking about how, like, baseball players have been conditioned growing up to just, like, throw money at just, like, travel teams and, mm-hmm. like, new bats and, like, new gloves and, like, private lessons, like, hitting lessons pitching lessons like all all this stuff and like how javelin is like the like total opposite of that where we never really had a lot you you don't really hear of private javelin coaches that much and especially online and you know you might do like one there might be a couple camps a year in like various states but they're not super popular whereas like in baseball you got like a showcase and one every every week week, every week yeah so like baseball players are just conditioned to just like have to pay for everything from the time their kids are like eight. So being older or not being older, but like now people usually go to Javelin when they're older in America, like usually like 16 and older. And so, you know, you get a decent amount of kids in like that age group that their parents are willing to like get them help and stuff and pay for it. Um, but a lot of the older generation, like I would say a lot of people older than me, like 25 and above or whatever, it's still a very new thing to like pay for online javelin coaching or like um, private lessons in general. And I think that like there's some older like javelin coaches that might have like a negative view on like what Kevin and I are trying to do in terms of like making money off of it no one has ever charged for it before yeah so it's just like a new thing in the javelin world um which i don't think is a bad thing because like we've talked about before you know kevin being able to be a full-time online javelin coach is going to be able to get really good at learning how to coach people online for javelin because he's done it since he was 24 so now he's like been doing it for six years and he's really good at it now. And so then it's like the same thing with me. Like I'm obviously hybrid. Most of my stuff that I do is in person, but I do have some online programs that are kind of like do it yourself, follow along. Um, I don't really do anything like, like Kevin's got a course and like all that stuff. It's very detailed. Mine is all like by the program, run through it on your own. Um, and so I just think that it's like a, it's a very new thing, but it's like, um, because I am, you know, once I was two years into my career of coaching, you know, I started at 23. By the time I hit my two, basically like two year anniversary of coaching full time, I was able to go full time with Javelin between coaching at Southern and Jack Javelin. And that is like now if I do that for the rest of my life, I'm going to be able to be a really good Javelin coach because your Javelin coach, whatever, was a history teacher during the day hours or whatever and and then goes to coach javelin 
yeah after school or whatever where it's like me this is all i do all day from the time i'm 25 until however long i decide to do it so i'm going to be able to keep that pace up and continue to refine my craft and refine my technique and grow my business whereas like a lot of other people that's their side thing they're like oh i do lessons like one day a week or like whatever it's like this is all i do so yeah. i'm gonna get good at it it's like strength coaches like online strength conditioning is relatively new like if you wanted to go if i want to learn about any type of coaches like ideology or like what they do in their weight room all i have to do is look up their instagram and i'm pretty sure i can get a pretty i could get a good idea of like how they run sessions and like what they do like if you want to do that 30 40 years ago you would have to fly out wherever they are and like actually go spend a day to visit them like call their business it's like say you want like fi- like figure out like who they are because like, a lot of it like wasn't accessible and i remember there's a story of like like when med ball training first started, like no one thought to throw the med ball into the wall, so it came back. So they were just chucking it, like like letting Super it fly, far. having having a partner be like twenty yards away, catching it, throwing it back, and then someone went into like a facility and they had a full med ball wall, and now and they're like, that's a great idea. Like now I don't have to go run and chase the med ball every single time. Like I can just throw it into the wall, it comes right back to me. Now, pretty much every gym or every sports performance center that I know of has a med ball wall. Like that wasn't always the case. Like something simple like that, like someone just had that idea of like, let's throw it at the cement wall and hope it doesn't crack it. <laughs> yeah. like, and then let's come it back. So like, like that changed the way people use med ball training completely. Like that's not what they were doing before. They're doing like the Russian twists and like the sit ups and stuff like with that really like thick, like bouncy med balls that you can't really throw or slam or really do anything. Yeah. So like, I could just change that and like there's plenty of like really great coaches that are able to produce content that you can learn from there's also a little flip side of that like the negative is that there's just so much information like it's hard to like sift through like what's good and what's bad yeah but I think that's still like a pot like a net positive and like the whole thing of like the online sphere and like yeah too much information yeah but like still like the javelin thing is like we've talked about this before like you being online kevin being online like stein having his stuff online like you guys are all really good at what you do like so if a high school kid is learning from you guys he's going to be much better off than like the history teacher that's like picking up the jab like the jab coach in their random high school it's usually don't even have a coach yeah they've never like, thrown it before they've never thrown it before they have no idea yeah. what a crossover step is they don't yeah. know what pen ultimate is they don't even know the weights of the javelin they're just throwing spears that's all they yeah. got that's what i think is the funniest thing about coaches like fighting with me online is like 99 percent of my audience probably hasn't thrown like 60 meters right probably like very few like i would say majority of them are like whether they're high school kids or college kids like that's the majority of the people that i work with is people that are like throwing like 130 to like 160 you know what i mean Mm. and it's like okay i threw 197 from a seven step it's like whether you believe that you know what I teach is right or wrong. I know I can help a kid who's throwing 120 feet. Yeah. So please, it doesn't matter that much that like, you know what I mean? It's like the technique is not, I don't know. It's like, obviously technique matters. We talked about it in the last episode, but it's just like to the point where you get so pissed off that you're like commenting like all this hate and stuff like that. Yeah. It's a lot of it. It's just just like, dude, it's not that serious. Yeah. That's all I got. Strength training. It's important. We didn't talk about Olympic lifts. Don't do them. Don't do them. <laughs> no, I want to talk about Olympic lifts because baseball players are scared to do Olympic lifts, but javelin throwers do them a lot. So I think that I think it's a really good topic to cover. Yeah. So we could talk about it. I think, well, I remember I can blame Heenan 100% for this because he made a post about it when I was in junior year high school. And I was starting to do Olympic lifts and like starting to learn them. And I was like, wow, these exercises just suck. Like I just didn't like them. Mainly because I wasn't really good Those at are them. Max. I did 205 and a hang clean for three. Hang power clean for three. 
Nice. At 17 years old. So I was like, yeah, but my wrist hurt. (laughs) But it was like... You were catching it like this? No, I was catching it in the front rack. I just didn't like him. But then um, he just made a post that made sense to me. I really should have questioned it more. I, I do now. But he was like, we don't Olympic lift with our athletes just because there is a little bit higher risk of wrist sprains. So if you sprain your wrist, you can't play your position at all regardless of what position you are. If you don't have one of your hands, you're useless. Like you can't hold a bat, you can't throw a ball, you can't catch the ball. So we will do other ways of finding out how to get triple extension, whether it be through jumps, sprints, plyometrics, like kettlebell swings, like other variations that we do that have a lesser risk of injury with similar reward output. And in my mind, I was like, perfect. I'm never doing these again. Like, I hate these. So, perfect. I do now see, like, the benefits of them. If you are an athlete that is willing to put in the time to get good at them. So, I'll add that in. Like, there is a very highly technical component of Olympic lifts and, like, in all their variations. And, like, being able to do them properly. I shy away from them a lot with our high school kids mainly because I just see how they move in general and adding a bar and like adding the complexity of like what different transitions and phases there is of the lift, how to catch it properly, how to drop it properly, how to like make sure your weights are correct and everything like that. Where at where their goblet squat is like really shitty. They can't do five straight like strict push ups or they can't even do a pull up or they, they sprint or they're just really slow and they're not consistent. Like, they're not showing up consistently. So, yeah, I'll teach them one week. They're gone for two weeks. I have to start all over again oh the God, next that's week. The worst. Yeah. So, I understand from a collegiate sector, if you were to teach Olympic lifts, it makes a lot more sense to go through step by step because those athletes are required to be there and they are going to be there like every single session. So, you can plan it out much further ahead and actually progress them properly. In the private sector, if you're doing a group, very hard to do. So if you're doing a one-on-one with an athlete that plays football and they want to do them, like then you could take them through it and like that you have more time and like they're set in their schedule. So they're like going to be on it. But like with like high school, like athletes, whether like they have fall ball games or practice and they have um, like other commitments or they go play basketball in the off season or they play football in the fall or they go away on vacation like it doesn't make sense to like spend the time it's just going to be like repetitive of just like doing the same thing so that's why i don't like them we also train a lot of baseball athletes i just feel like there's a lot of different variations that you can use to get this similar outputs not saying like it'll be the exact same but there are very similar qualities that we'll get out of athletes that like we'll be able to be like all right that's that's good like they got faster they jumped higher like they're throwing harder, further, uh, hitting the ball better. Like they're doing everything that we want. We don't need to worry about the any type of risk with an Olympic lift. Like we don't need to teach it. Like we're good. Yeah, I will say like I do love, I love two aspects of it for javelin throwers. One is that it's a great central nervous system, like firing exercise. Like if you do that, like we like Jordan and Nevin do that the day before their meets every time it's because like it's just really good to like learn how to keep the arms relaxed like you do in your throw get the power from the legs and like you said get that triple extension and like um and then you're firing up your central nervous system so those two components are really helpful is like arms relaxed explosive with the legs and then fire right so you're working on kind of like that same feeling of like the throw and then um, firing up your central nervous system, getting that ready for the competition, whatever the next day. The third thing, or the second the second thing, is that um, it like you talked about with the wrist. Is that if your elbow and tricep and forearm isn't able to get into that like front rack position and hold weight in there, like a lot of times that shows that you like lack the mobility. And um, you know I've dealt with a lot of throwers that. You know, when they have really tight forearms or wrists or triceps doing that front rack position and doing like a back bridge and some forearm stretches and stuff like that really helps their arm pain where it's like 
they have a lot of arm pain because they're super, super tight, and then they can't get into that front squat position. And then it's like, all right, we'll rework the mobility, get them to the point where they're able to do the back bridge, front squat position, loaded, do like a power clean, hand clean type movement, and catch it on their fingertips and get their elbows through. And then it's like you see at the same time that will clean up their arm pain because it shows that like they were so tight. So it's like, it's one of those things like, I think it's ironic that you were saying that Heenan talked about that. I get, I get the reason why, because it is obviously when you're going for an explosive, like one rep max type movement or whatever, it is risk in, involved. But like at the same time, he's the one that told me to like go like full yeah. extension and don't shy away from stuff. Right. So he's obviously a smart guy. He knows what he's talking about. And you know, you're not going to do like a one rep max dumbbell knee up rotator mm. but i just think that like I, I like to take that approach of like if you can't do something why can't you do it figure out like what's holding you back from it and like if it is your wrist and forearm and tricep mobility that's probably a low hanging fruit that if you improve that not only will you then be able to do the power clean but it'll like help your throw or help your arm pain or some other low hanging fruit that you probably have as well yeah i mean it definitely work uh again i think it's just you need to have an athlete that's willing to put in the time to actually get the most out of it yeah i think the the risk does come from just like overloading it too fast too soon i think i've seen i've seen a ton of just really 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 bad cleans from just like high school football weight rooms and like everyone's just catching it and like a starfish and like they're like not getting into the front rack they're just like reverse curling it they're sideways they're just dropping plates like they're flying everywhere and like there's sometimes in like that weight room like when i train at the high school that weight room there's no chance i would do olympic lifts in there because we have th- over 30 guys we have five racks yeah and we have freshmen sophomores juniors and seniors like the whole spread and then 75 percent of them have never worked out a day in their life yeah so and i'm there two times a week and i can't and i don't have the freaking roster because a lot of these kids haven't even made the team yet so yeah, i don't yeah, even yeah. know i don't even know half their kids names yeah so like i know what you mean it, it is tough like i i think it, it's like it's one of those things too though where like we power cleaned in high school and like it was just it looked terrible for yeah people. it looked terrible for three years yeah it never looked better then it was like my senior year one of the kids on my team started like going to a crossfit gym with his cousin or whatever he started catching it higher where i was like here i was like oh i want to learn how to do that so i got kind of good at that like lighter weights and then i got to college the next year and it was even more of a focus and then it was like by the end of my freshman year of college i was like great at it and yeah. then it was like i was 19 and i had the rest of my life so it was like yeah it took me like five years to get to that point but at the same time it took me still five years to learn how to squat still took me like five years to like be able to hit over like 250 on bench yeah you know so it's like it's a learning process no matter what um but yeah i mean it's obviously like greater risk greater reward we always had that that story of like that kid in high school that like cleans it up here and then just falls straight back and it lands <laughs> on his neck. <laughs> that actually happened. Oh, God. With my football team. Yeah, so, like, what adaptation did he get there? <laughs> Death? <laughs> <laughs> That's Snow what I always angel. look at. I was like, when I look at, like, the really heavy, like, really poor form, like, hand clean, power clean, whatever clean you're doing, what adaptation did you get out of that lift? I was like, really, like, probably... It wasn't a powerful movement because it was pretty slow coming up. It's pretty slow catch, pretty shitty catch. Didn't catch it in an athletic position whatsoever. Yeah. And he almost died. <laughs> so I was like, so what yeah, did I we mean, yeah, what did we benefit? What do we benefit from that? I was like, if we had a jump mat out and I tracked your dumbbell jumps, like heavy weights, like heavy-ish weights, like 40, 45 pound dumbbells or a trap bar, and I had you jump on the jump mat and I saw that you're vertical jump was like 20 20 20 the next week we did it same weight 22 22 22 i saw like a vis- like a visual adaptation of what we got quantifiable 
yeah we're able to like see it and then we can also get into like bar speed stuff and everything with the olympic lifts but yeah. save that for another time yeah i hear you though it is it is a complex movement and like nevin was someone like that who uh Just freaking demolished his wrist yeah his sophomore year because it was like his freshman year we went really late with it he got used to it and then sophomore year he started trying to max it out and so he like almost broke his wrist but he's all right now though yeah he's good at it now though <laughs> <laughs>